11, 1963, Governor George Wallace defied the federal courts by standing in front of the doors of the University of Alabama to keep two black students from entering in. Wallace told the black students that the only way they were going to enter the all-white state-run university was over his dead body. This racist governor was attempting uh, to maintain a system of segregation in the University of Alabama. The only problem was that the United States government sent down U.S. Marshals, which are federal agents, to escort the two black students inside so they could begin attending classes with white students. The U.S. Marshals told Governor Wallace that he had two choices. He could remove himself voluntarily under his own power from in front of the university front doors, or they would certainly do it for him. Furthermore, they told Wallace that one thing's for sure, they were not going to allow him to block the law of the United States, which said he was not going to maintain segregation at the University of Alabama, especially when federal dollars allowed the school to operate. They told him that things were going to change that day, and it was up to him to decide how things were going to end, whether he was going to get out of the way or they were going to remove him by force. Of course, Wallace took the smart option and removed himself from blocking the, uh, the black students from in entering and attending school that day. When, you, when God joins you into a lion's den, and Satan has taken a stand against you. And he's gotten your friends to stand against you, your boss to stand against you, and everybody around you to stand against you. God wants you to know that today's, that he has the final decision. There's another, another court up in heaven, and when that court sends its marshals, God's court can overrule whatever system is holding you down. The Bible says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. Isaiah 59 and 19. Today we open a new book of the Bible. As we close out the book of Genesis on last week, chapter 50 is a continuation of Genesis, I mean of Exodus chapter 1. I'll give you a little bit of background on the book of Exodus. In the Greek language, Exodus means the way out. This book describes Israel's bondage in Egypt and the wonderful deliverance or way out that God provided them. One of the key words in the Exodus is redemption. Since to redeem means to set free, the book represents many pictures of our salvation through Jesus Christ. The word Exodus is used in two places in the New Testament in Luke 9 and 31 where Christ's redeeming work on the cross is the theme, and in 2 Peter 1.15, where it means a believer's death. In other words, there are three ex Exodus experiences in the Bible. Israel's deliverance from Egypt, Christ's deliverance of the sinner through the cross, and the believer's deliverance from the bondage of this world at death. The author of this great book, most biblical scholars believe Moses wrote this first, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The unity of the book of Exodus suggests that there was one author, and the eyewitness accounts indicate that the author was present for the vast majority of the events. Christ affirmed Moses' authorship of the book in John 7 and 19. The purpose of the book, Genesis is the book of beginnings, Exodus, is the book of redemption. It records the deliverance of Israel from Egypt and presents the basic historical facts about the origins of the Hebrew nation and its religious ceremonies. These accounts are also pictures of Christ and the redemption he purchased at the cross. There are many types of symbols of Christ and the believer in Exodus, especially in the tabernacle furnishings and ceremonies. Exodus also records the giving of the law. It would be impossible to understand much New Testament doctrine apart from an understanding of the events and symbols in the book of Exodus. Symbolism in Exodus is throughout. There are several basic types of symbols in Exodus. 
Egypt is a type of the world system, opposing God's people and trying to keep them in bondage. Pharaoh is a type of Satan, the God of this world who demands worship, defies God, and thinks uh, he can enslave God's people. Israel is a type of church. Don't get it twisted. I didn't say Israel was the church or the church was Israel. Is delivered from bondage of the world, led on a pilgrim journey, and protected by God was Israel. Moses is a type of Christ, God's prophet. The crossing of the Red Sea is a picture of, of the resurrection which delivers the believer from this present evil world. The manna pictures Christ, the bread of life. The smitten rock is a type of the smitten Christ through whose death the Holy Spirit is given. Amalekite is a picture of the flesh opposing the believer in the pilgrimage journey. The key type in Exodus is the Passover, picturing the death of Christ, the application of his blood for our safety and the appropriation of his life, the feeding of the lamb for our daily strength. In other words, without the book of Exodus, it is uh, and is foundational for both the Jewish and Christian view of who God is. For our understanding of morality and for our introduction to the nature of worship, and with all this, Exodus stands as one of the greatest adventure stories in the book of all times. The key people of Exodus are Moses, the deliverer, lawgiver, and leader of the Jews during the Exodus. Aaron, the brother of Moses, who was appointed Israel's high priest. Miriam, the sister of Moses, who's appointed as a prophetess. Pharaoh, the arrogant young ruler of Egypt, who fought against God despite crushing miracles of divine judgment. Some of the key events of Exodus, Moses' discovery, Moses' call, the Ten Plagues, the Passover instituted, the Ten Commandments, and the tabernacle designed for worship with God. As Exodus begins, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are trapped in Egypt, enslaved by Pharaoh who no longer remembers or cares about the help given his people by Joseph some 430 years earlier. Today's series, we begin today, is entitled God's People and the Trials of Exodus. And in chapter 1, our sermon title for today's message is When God's People Face Persecution. Amen? Romans 8 and 28 says, All things work together for the good, for them that love God and them are called according to his purpose. Listen to how the Apostle Paul uh, words that verse. It is God's divine word because Paul couldn't write it unless God told him. He says all things. That means everything you and I face, God's in control of it. He didn't say some things, he said all things. But he also went on to say that all things work together for the good. Amen? And now there's a condition. For them that love God and for them that are called according to his purpose. Amen? Amen? If you're here today, if you're listening online today, and you are indeed a believer, and you indeed love God, and you are indeed called according to his purpose, God promises not that everything will be good, but he promises to work it for your good. Amen? Amen. And what we see in this text is we see that God's amazing hand is still upon his people. If you remember when... Jacob went down to Egypt because Joseph was already in Egypt. We've been talking about that for the last so many weeks. Amen? And when they get down to Egypt, they're about 72 in number when they got there, and to include Joseph, his wife, and his sons. So you have less than 80 people that this family and nation began with. But did you know by the time they leave Egypt, they have grown into more than 2 million people. Even though Pharaoh turned up the heat, even though they had hard taskmasters, even though Pharaoh told them when to get up in the morning and when to go to bed at night, Pharaoh controlled every aspect of their lives. So therefore, Egypt is a picture of what it means to be lost in the Bible. Amen? Moses is a picture of redemption because he's the one drew, drew them out. God used to draw them out. 
So, what led to the severe persecution of God's people in the book of Exodus? Well, three things. Three things I want to share with you this morning that led to the persecution of God's people in the book of Exodus. Number one, a new generation. Number two, a new king. And number three, a new strategy. All right? You had a new generation, you had a new king, and you had a new strategy. So let's deal with the new, new generation. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. It said, now these are the names of the son of Israel who came to Egypt with, with Jacob. They came, each one, with his household, Reuben and Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. These verses of Exodus reach back some 430 years. The story of the Exodus begins where the story of Genesis ends. A large family with a crucial place in God's plan of, of the ages and their migration to Egypt. And it says, and Joseph died. Joseph was a remarkable great-grandson of Abraham who saved Egypt and the world from the terrible famine. Because he listened to God's voice speaking through Pharaoh's dream, because of his wisdom and administration, he was lifted to a high and honored office in Egypt. Yet eventually, Joseph died. And the status his family enjoyed died with him. You got to follow the story. As long as Joseph was alive and that Pharaoh was alive, they lived in Goshen and they, they received favor as long as Joseph was alive. But the scripture tells us that that generation died. It said all the persons who came from the loins of, jo of Jacob were 70 in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. The summary of those verses is a lengthy period of time moves the record from the death of Joseph, which is 1804 B.C., the last recorded events in, in, in Genesis through the radical change in Israel's history from favor before Egypt's Pharaoh to disfavor and enslavement. In other words, they moved from being blessed in Goshen. They moved from eating the choicest food, the same food, that Joseph was able to eat, being second in command to Pharaoh. But it's when, when Joseph died and time went on, nobody even remember what Joseph did, not in Egypt. Not only that, another Pharaoh rose up, which is the second point, a new king, verses 8 through 14. It said, but the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. This was a transitional period in the history of Israel. The divine favor Israel once enjoyed under Joseph was no longer extended to them. They become free people. They went from free people to enslaved people. Again, Pharaoh now dominated their lives. He put hard taskmasters over them, and they had to produce hard labor for Pharaoh to build up Egypt. Again, they were told when to get up, when they could eat, when they can go to bed at night. And they did not have one day off. Could you imagine having to get up at old dark 30, which is what we call in the military, way before there's even a sunlight at old dark 30. And you get up and you start working. You not only work from the time the crack of dawn, you work all the way to sundown. You could say, hey, hey, hey boss, can, can I get some leave? <laughs> can, can, can I get a few days off to go to dinner appointment? Can I get a lunch break? Can I get this or can I get that? Then Pharaoh said no. So that now you understand what Pharaoh did. So that you could keep working on your job site, you couldn't leave the job site. He would put these big old pots of stew mixed with meat and vegetables right there on this job site. You can eat all you want, but guess what? You could not leave that job site. 
Whatever labor you were assigned to, you did that once again, whether male or female, and he even enslaved your children and put them to work as well. This was Pharaoh. Pharaoh was a hard man. You got to understand something. Pharaoh was religious, but Pharaoh wasn't a believer. Pharaoh was very religious. In fact, pharaohs at that time felt that they were deities. Why do you think they built all the Egyptian pyramids and they put all their stuff with them? When a, when a pharaoh died, all of his cars went in the grave with him. All his possessions, his Rolexes went in the grave with him. All of his fancy alligator shoes went in the, all his robes, everything he owned. Everything he owned went in the grave with him. You know why they buried all your stuff with you if you was a pharaoh? Because they had a false belief that you, in your next life, you're going to need it. A false belief that in your next life, that you pick up where you left off because all your stuff comes with you. Now, if you have that kind of twisted belief, I'm just here to tell you now that nothing you have in this world will be taken to the next world. Amen? Nothing you have right now is going to go with you to heaven or hell. All right? Because you will need neither there. Your fancy house, won't, you won't need that in heaven, nor in hell. All your possessions, you can't use them. All the money you save, you can't spend that there. There's no line of credit in hell. There's like no line of credit in heaven. Your MasterCard won't do you anything, any good either place. Because all of your material possessions are given on this side so that you can use them to glorify God. But because, again, Egyptians serve a multitude of gods. They had sun gods, rain gods, fertility gods. They had storm gods, wind gods. They worshiped any god that was a god, small g, by the way. Again, they were very religious. But that doesn't mean they were Christian. doesn't mean they were believers. This is that pharaoh. This is that system that they now found themselves in all this time. Oh, by the way, by now, they've been there 430 years. That's how long it's been since the close of the book of Genesis. Since the close of the book of Genesis, then we get to chapter 1, over 400 years have elapsed. They're no longer a family of about 70-something members. They are now a nation of 2 million plus. And what's interesting about this story is the fact that Pharaoh, they tried their best so that these people wouldn't grow and multiply. But the more they pressed them, the more they pushed them, guess what? God allowed them to grow into a nation, even in adversity. So when God's people face persecution, when God's people face suffering, is what this book of Exodus teaches us how to deal with the troubles of life. Amen? It says once again, verse 7, but the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, the Egyptians, behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier. Now, they didn't have no guns. They didn't have no Uzis. They had no bats. They had no shields. They had no chariots. Why does Pharaoh believe they're more and mighty? By sheer numbers. You know what Pharaoh feared? He feared that one day they're going to get tired of us ruling over with, with our foot on their neck. They're going to get tired of that and they're going to rebel. And they're going to come and they, they're going to get in numbers and they're going to fight against us. That's what Pharaoh was afraid of. Now what Pharaoh could have done, where he did not have to fear him, all this Pharaoh had to do was continue to treat them like the previous Pharaoh under Joseph. That's what he could have done. Now, you understand this 430 years later, so this is many pharaohs later. Unless he checked the, the, uh, the chronicles of the kingdom and go back and research, he wouldn't have never heard of Joseph. He wouldn't have known how Joseph, God had used Joseph to save not only uh, the Israelites and his people, God used him to save the whole world because, remember, the whole world was under the famine. All right? The people of the Egyptian pharaoh designated himself as a nation. 
marking the first time that the term people or nation is used to identify them. Verse 10, he says, come, let us now deal wisely with them. Is that really wise? Well, we're going to find out whether or not it was. Or else they will multiply, and in, in, in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us. Well, if you wouldn't be doing what you're doing, then people would be hating on you. You got to understand something about Egypt. The rulers and pharaohs, these are black people, by the way. If you didn't know any better and you don't understand the Bible, these are black people. These were cruel black people. Pharaohs, pharaohs were cruel men. And what they would do to you, what the Egyptians would do to you, they would, they would rip a woman's baby out, out from her and throw it down on concrete and dash it where the skull breaks. Oh, you thought that it was just white people that offended the other race of people. There was actually a time when the most dominant people on this planet were black people because they were the Egyptians. At this particular time, the Egyptians are the big dog on the block. The Egyptians forced their will throughout the world, and especially throughout the area of the Middle East during that time. And they didn't just were cruel. They weren't just cruel to the Israelites. They were cruel to every nation around them. So that's why he said, well, that's why this Pharaoh says what he says. He said, unless they join with these other nations around us that hate us, because we've given them every reason to hate us, we treat them bad too. That's what he was afraid of. That's what led him to persecute God's people even more. Amen? He says, so verse 11, so they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Python and Ramses. Taskmasters. Israel was assessed both as a Israel was assessed both as a threat to national security and an economic asset. You, did you see that? First of all, they feared them. They feared the uprising. Anytime you hold a people in, in bondage, you always live in fear. I don't care who you are. In the United States, during the time of slavery, do you realize as, as, as slave, African slaves uh, began to multiply in many of the southern states, do you know, realize one of the biggest fear of white people at that time was there would be an uprising and they're going to kill us. So when they have the slave revolts, if you read about the, the black slave revolts, when they rebelled against, they were afraid of that happening all over the South. Because it's something about when you mistreat people and you know you're doing them wrong, you always live in guilt. Because if you're treating them right, then you have to worry about it. See, it's like the guy who never treats his wife right, so he has to go to sleep with one eye open at night. That guy. That guy. Because he, he, he's fearful because he's been mean all day. He's been brutal all day. And he heard those stories about hot grits and frying pans. So that guy can't get no good sleep because he's cruel. And so when he go down at night, he have to, you know, have one eye cocked open, see what this woman is doing. Well, he wouldn't have to worry about that if he just loved her and be nice to her. Amen? Anytime you oppress people, guess who God comes to the rescue of? The oppressed. There are plenty of scriptures that talks about what God is going to do to those who oppress people. God has a problem with one race of people thinking it's better than another race of people. God has a problem when one nation thinks it's better than another nation. Which we happen to think in America that we've been everybody else. Unfortunately, we're not. Amen? In God's eyes, we're people. Amen? And anytime, once again, you oppress people, you have to deal with the creator. Because God didn't create us to oppress one another. Oppression of, of each race and each people is a direct result of fallenness, of sinfulness. You treat people like that because you're operating out of your own sinful flesh. One of the things that happens when God touches your heart and you actually become a believer, you actually begin to love people. Genuinely. You even begin to love people who don't love you back. 
Because genuine love is not based on the receiver, it's based on the giver. Amen? And when God has been good to you, no matter who be hating on you, you're going to have an attitude and a spirit of love. And you're going to want the best for any and everybody to cross your path, even those people who don't like you, even those people who don't look like you. Amen? Because you can always ch tell when a person's heart is really changed. It's how they treat people that's another believer. See, an unsaved vessel and a saved vessel cannot communicate love together. It's a disconnect. Because our definition of love as a believer is different than the definition of love of an unbeliever. Because an unbeliever can tell you that they love you, but they'll still cheat on you. An unbeliever will tell you they love you and they'll rob you. Well, that's not love. You cannot do all those things hurting people and especially hurting the people you love and say, well, I love you. Because John addresses that in his epistle. The apostle John addresses that. He says in verse 4 of John chapter 1, in that text, he says, greater he, he is capitalized, a pronoun for the Holy Spirit. He said, greater he that's in me and you than he that's in the world. You know what he means by that? And why does John bring that up? Because he's talking about, he's talking about loving, genuine love of how we're supposed to care for one another, look after one another as Christians, as, as God's people, as the body of Christ. Because he goes on to say in, in verse 20 of chapter 4, he said, how can you say you love God whom you cannot see? And you can't even love your brother right in front of you. So John says the litmus test of whether or not you believe is how you treat another believer. The reason why is because every believer has the Holy Spirit, but just because the Holy Spirit is resident don't mean he's president. You, still have, you and I still have to yield to the Holy Spirit leading in our lives. Because remember, God has forgiven me and you far more than what we've done to anybody. You always got to remember that. People have done you wrong. I know that. I understand that. People have done me wrong. But my sin was greater than what God had to forgive them for. In fact, he had to forgive me more than whatever they did against me. Because I did far more against him than they ever did against me. So who had the greater level of forgiveness? But we are so self-righteous. When someone forgives us, we want mercy, we want grace, but we don't want to extend any. And there's something we should learn how God's people were dealt with and how the Egyptians dealt with them in this text. Amen? Appointing these cruel leaders over them. Could you imagine being at work and your boss standing not too far from you and he got a whip? Could you imagine? You sitting there goofing off or taking a break, taking a coffee break? <laughs> How would you feel about that? How would you feel about your boss could whip you at any time? He could hit you at as many stripes as he wanted to and nothing you could do about it. All because he said you ain't moving fast enough. All because he says you're not working hard enough. This is what they went through. Oh, because we don't read the text, we don't understand what they went through. We just, we just, oh, they were just held in slave. They was held in bond. They couldn't leave. Well, they couldn't leave, but they, it wasn't just that. They worked, made them work their fingers to the bone, literally. Remember, they didn't have modern medicines. What happened if you on the job and broke your arm? Oh, you thought that you, you went on convalescent leave. Or, or you thought you went downtown to the courthouse and filed your paperwork and got some uh, relief. Some workman's comp. No. You broke your arm, you bandaged that up as best you could, and you get out there and work with that other arm. And still, they still require you to do the same amount of work. Oh, but you don't read the text. But you always talking about what a bad day you had. This wasn't just a bad day. This was generations. This was over 400 years that they went through this. Their children were born as slaves. They were slaves. Their grandchildren were slaves. And all this time, they're crying out to God. 
Remember, this is 400 years that they, did, they couldn't worship God. Because remember, Egypt represents sin and bondage, and you cannot worship God in sin and bondage. This is when Moses comes on the scene. That's why Moses was trying to get them to allow them to take a three days journey outside of Egypt at the mountain of God at Mount Sinai so they can worship God. You cannot worship God when you're consumed by your troubles. You cannot worship God when your focus is not on God and your focus is on your troubles. If anything that Exodus teaches us is how we ought to behave as believers, how we have to still call on God, even when he's not moving, we want him to move. But I will tell you this. It may take God a long time to move, but when he does, it don't take him long. Amen. Because when he moves, he move, he'll move quickly, even though he may have delayed. And you might say, well, why did he delay? And the reason why he delayed all these 400 plus years is because the nation was not the nation that he needed to be to go rescue. And at the appointed time that he had set, he was going to send a savior. He's going to rescue them. But not until that time. It said they afflicted upon them, the Egyptians, for his labor. The servant here described is, is not domestic slavery, as was the case with Joseph. The term here is described harsh oppression. See, remember, Joseph was still a slave, but Joseph wasn't beat. Joseph lived in a nice house. Joseph ate on his own terms, but he still served Pharaoh. He was still a slave. This type of slavery was different because this type of slavery was someone hovering over you, someone cracking the whip, someone forcing you to do what they want you to do, taking all your freedoms away. The Israelites were tasked with making bricks for building projects and laboring in the fields. The storage cities, Python and Ramses, were places where both provisions and military hardware were stored. They used them to build up those places. In verses 9 through 12, describing, it describes another summary of a fairly lengthy period of time as indicated by the population continuing to grow in spite of the increasing hardship imposed, by, uh, imposed on Israel. Verse 12 says, but more... The more they afflicted them, now here's the grace of God. Here's the hand of God. Here's the providence of God. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. Amen. I think some of y'all in the day, modern day vernacular that you'd understand that, they were like baby's kids. They didn't die, they multiplied. The more they beat them, the harsher they were to them. It says they multiplied. And so that they were in dread of the sun. In other words, the more, the, the, you got to follow the story. The more they beat them, the more they oppressed them, the more they dogged them, the more they made them long, work long hours, the more they, they controlled their schedules every day, that did not stop them because they were still having babies. They were still having babies. They were still growing as a nation. Through all of that oppression, they were still Growing into the nation God needed. And you say, why did God do this? Why did he do it that way? Because he was trying to create a people that would rely on him and not on anything else, the system of the world. Because remember, Egypt represents the system of the world. See, all this time, Jehovah was their king. Pharaoh was not their king. God wanted them to rely on him as their king. And he was preparing them so that when he gave them their own land, that they would act different. They would appreciate it more. They would have been glad to be free once he set them free. They would be glad to worship him and honor him every day. But they didn't. All you got to do is follow the story. Because look what happened when they did get their own land. Look how they began to serve the gods around them. That's what you and I do. God has certainly been good to us, has he not? When, why do you carry on that way? Why are you dipping and dabbling with them false gods? The way you do. If you say God is my law, oh, he's my Lord, he's my king, he's everything. How is it that your job has become your Lord? How is it that your finances has become your Lord? How have you allowed your children to become your Lord? To take God's place because the things you're supposed to be doing for God, you take all that time to do for them. And it doesn't mean you should not do for your children because you should. But I'll tell you this, that if your vertical relationship with God is broken, 
I promise you that nothing you do with your kids will please God. Nothing you do in your marriage will please God. And you're crying out to God, God, fix my marriage. God, please make her act right. Lord, please make these kids mine. And God says, when you start mining, then I'll work on them. When, when you start acting right, when you start, uh, uh, start possessing what you're confessing. Amen? The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to, uh, verse 13, labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter. You got somebody around you making your life bitter? Do you smile when you get them to go to work? Or you take your time? Maybe you take the scenic road going to work because you ain't too happy about being there. Or you like to pay, and you might not be crazy about that because you think they should be paying you more, but maybe that's only why you stay. Because the only reason why you think you're there is to earn a paycheck. When you've got it all twisted, when God has strategically placed you there because he needs one of his people to be a reflection of his glory in that place. See, it's never, with God, it's never about the money. Why would God be about the money with God when he owns everything? There ain't nothing you can show God that God said, Woo, wow, well, look at that check. <laughs> There's nothing bling that you got that make God go, oh, oh, man. There's nothing that you have. There's nothing that I have. Because the Bible tells us in Psalm 24, 1, that the earth is the Lord's. The fullness thereof and the world and all that's contained within it. It even goes on to say in Isaiah that the cattle on a thousand hills are his. So how can you impress God when he owns it all? So why are you still trying to impress him? With meager means. You know how you oppress God? Is you surrender your vessel, your person, to his will and let him impress himself through you. Amen. That's the only way God's impressed. He's only impressed with it, what he does. He's never impressed what we do. Amen? Amen? So third point, and final point, what led to the uh, severe persecution of God's people in the book of Exodus? The third point is a new strategy. First, again, a, a, a new generation, then a new king, and now a new strategy. Now watch this. This is this new Pharaoh. It said, note, the strategy of forced labor and oppressing Israel failed. Because the more they impress, the reason why he's oppressing them is because he doesn't want them to grow and have more babies. He doesn't want them to continue to grow as a nation. And Pharaoh thought if I make them work themselves to death, that when they got home, they would be so, so tired. Won't be no hanky-panky going on when they got home. Because they'd be so tired. But he was fooled. Because these men still had worked all day, still had vigor for their wives. Women worked all day, still had vigor for their husbands. Amen? His plan didn't work, so he had to come up with a new strategy. Well, what was this new strategy? Watch this. Strategy number one. This is the new strategy number one. Verse 15. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of uh, whom was named uh, Shifra, and the other was named Pua. And by them being named and singled out, it would lead you to believe that they were in supervisory roles over the other midwives. You got to understand. Or oh, you thought when they had a birth out of two million people, they had one birth a month. Or they had one birth a year. These babies were popping out all over the place. <laughs> these these, these uh, Israelite women, man, they were having babies left and right. Amen. Because God was doing that. God was making them fertile. God was causing them to expand his people. Could you only imagine working at the maternity ward? This wasn't just one little crying baby. This was a whole lot of babies. So you had what they had. Remember, they don't have a modern medical system. Oh, by the way, when you went to have a baby, they didn't put your feet in stirrups. Guess what they did? They gave you two, two stones one for one side, the other for the other side. And you sat and you squat as you sat on those stones to live that baby. Wouldn't you just love to live back then? 
Even more so, I bet when them, them, them kids start get, bumping their gums and giving their mom some lip, boy, you don't know what I went through to bring you in here. They weren't laying down with a, in a bed with a pillow behind their head. This was the common practice of child delivering. And so Pharaoh said, when we are, uh, uh, when we are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, that's what the birth stool was, he says, he t- here's what he tells the midwives. This was his first strategy. Because remember, he's trying to limit the population. He says, when they're on the birth stool, and if it's a son that, that is birthed, he said, then you shall put him to death. He actually told the midwives, deliver the child, then kill the child. If it was a male. If it was a girl, let it live. All right? Pharaoh could target males because they can, re- they can reproduce men in, uh, with many women. Men often had more than one wife in, the, in ancient Near East. Furthermore, since men can serve as soldiers, the Egyptians feared that the Israelites would become a rival military power. So they want to exterminate these boys. Again, burstu, the literal word that this comes from burstu is two stones on which women sat to deliver. Now watch this. Look at verse 17. It said, but the midwives feared God. The midwives that feared God and, and did not obey the king of Egypt. Do you realize that the king could have came back and put them to death? But see, God didn't let him put the midwives to death. As he had commanded, but he, they let the boys live. In other words, they knew that that was morally and spiritually wrong. And they basically said, we ain't doing it. Here's what you got to understand when the government is trying to get you to do something that's not right and break God's laws. Then the first thing you ought to say, I'm not doing it. Now, there may be consequences for you not doing it, but you have to take a stand like they took a stand. It said, these brave older women uh, reverenced their God and thus obeyed him and not man. He said, they obviously understood that children were a gift from God and that murder was wrong. But we don't understand that today. Because we still, I think I heard a statistic in the United States that we have aborted 63 million babies in the United States. 63 million. 63 million babies have been aborted. Something wrong with that. Because sometimes I believe that we cry out to God and we say, God, won't you fix that? God said, the person that I birthed into the world to do that, you killed them. The one that I had birthed in the world who had, would have become that, you took them out before they ever had a chance. That's what we don't understand. That's what they're trying to teach us about the value of life. But see, life should not just matter when the life is in the womb. Because a child is created upon uh, conception, not when the child leaves the womb. Because in Jeremiah 1.5, God tells Jeremiah, when you were in your mother's womb, I knew you, I called you, I appointed you to be a prophet among the nations. When you're in your mother's womb. That's what God tells Jeremiah. And that principle applies to me and you. We're not here by accident. You might not have been born into the best of situations, but the only way you were born because God said so. Because God created you. There's no such thing as illegitimate children, but there is a such thing as illegitimate parents. Amen? Because you might not have been born, once again, in the best of situations, but stop complaining about it. Because you're still here for a divine purpose. You might be going through a difficult time right now, but you're still here for a divine purpose. People might be oppressing you. Your finances may be oppressing you right now, but you're still here for a divine purpose. Things might not be going too well with your health right now, but you're still here for a divine purpose. People might not like you, but you're still here for a divine purpose. You might feel as though nobody loves you, but you're still here for a divine purpose. But it's up to you and it's up to me to get with God to figure out what that purpose is. Proverbs 19, 21 says there are many plans in a man's heart. But only the purposes of God prevail. If you want to succeed in this life, 
Well, you know with absolute certainty that I will always succeed in everything I do. All you got to do is do what God wants you to do. Amen. Amen. So stop telling your, telling your children, your grandchildren, your family members, and anybody else, you can be anything you want to be. That is some of the worst advice you can give people. Because you can attempt to become something God never created you to be. The best advice you can give people, especially young people, you tell them that they can be all that God created them to be. Because if they get with God's plan and apply God's plan to their life, it doesn't matter who tries to stop them. They're still going to succeed. It has nothing to do with your bank account, your income level, or any of those things. If God says you're going to go to one of the most prestigious schools where you're paying $100,000 a year for education, for tuition, room and board, food and all that, then if that's what God says, you can be broke, but that's where you're going. Amen. Amen. You can be broke. Some dear friends of ours, the Williamson family, that we love dearly. Military just like we are, uh, were, retired. Here he is, he's the master sergeant in the United States Air Force. And so his son gets to the point where he is going to college. His son was offered to go to any of the three academies. He could have went to the Naval Academy. He could have went to uh, the Air Force Academy. He could have went to West Point, the Army Academy. Do you know, he, you know how hard it is to get accepted to one of the cad military academies for a free education? He got accepted all three. Turned them all down. At the time, his parents didn't like that decision because he told his parents, I'm going to Princeton. His parents said, boy, we ain't got no Princeton money. He said, I'm going to Princeton. So where did he go? And where did he graduate from? Princeton. Do you know that his son got to Princeton, met a good friend, turned out his friend, dad was rich. Yeah, his friend, dad was rich. Do you know that his friend, dad, helped pay that tuition, that See, that's how God works. See, it's not based on what you have. That's, that's where we get it twisted. It's not based on what you have and what you own. It's who owns you and who has you, which should be Jesus Christ. Because if God has set aside something he would have you and I to accomplish, then God has to pick up the tab. But here's the key. If you do it your way, you have to pay for it. Do it your way. You have to pick up the tab. That's what some of y'all are going through right now. That's why you're struggling where you are, because you got it, you're doing it your way. But if you do it God's way, then God picks up the tab. God builds it. God finances. God funds it, if it's a God thing. Amen. Amen. And you're a God child. Amen. But again, verse 17, the midwives feared God. And they did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. Now, because they disobeyed the king, they had to go see the king. Look at verse 18. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and let these boys live? Now, you got to understand, he's not asking nicely. That's not how this is coming across. He's asking in a threatening manner that you disobeyed me, that something bad is going to happen to you. That's how he's responding to them. Look what they said. The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. Did they look different? Did one have more money than the other? Did, did one have a, 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 a better doctor than the other? Is that what he's saying? No. He said, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives can get to them. In other words, they get there. To, they, they get there. To help deliver a child, they get there and the mother already holding the child. Amen. I don't know about you, I think that's kind of difficult, that kind of challenging for you to help birth your own child. And the, and the midwife who gets there to help you birth the child, that you holding the child when they get there. That's what they told Pharaoh. They basically told Pharaoh, it's not our fault. 
He said, the, they say, it's not our fault the Egyptian women that, that's slow in birth. That we got all day waiting on them to have a child. Come on now. But we don't have to do that with these Hebrew women. Boy, they fast. They don't be messing around. Them babies be popping right out of there. That's all we're done deal by the time I got there. That we got there, they say. Despite Pharaoh's strict orders to kill the Hebrew male children, the Hebrew midwives showed a boldness and faith in God. As such, they refused to follow the law of man because they operated by a higher law, which is God's law. Question, what law do you live by? Man's or God's? Verse 20, so God was good. Watch this. God was good to the midwives. And the people multiplied and became very mighty. Again, another example of how God rewards the faithful. Verse 21, because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. You realize most of the time midwives were not married women. Did you know that? Most of the time, midwives spend all this time having other women birth their children, watching them hold them once they clean them up and hand them to them. But most of them midwives did not have their own children. Guess what God did? He fixed that. Because of their faithfulness. Because of their faith. Remember, these midwives were often older women. Oftentimes, they were past childbearing years in the natural realm. But supernaturally, God allowed them to bear children of their own. That's what happens when you're faithful to God. God does the impossible in your life. Amen? Strategy number two. That was strategy number one. It didn't work because the midwives wouldn't cooperate. Strategy number two. Verse 22. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people. He told all the Egyptians to do this. He said, every son who is born, you are to cast him into the Nile. He said, since we can't catch them, since they're coming out too fast, once they come out, Go drown them in the river. He told all of them to do that. He said, and every daughter you should keep alive. Once again, same strategy, different method. He wanted to kill the males, but let the, the, the girls live. Kill, kill the boys, let the, the, the girls live. All his people. Now, this was a law that Pharaoh put into uh, play what he told all of the Egyptians. In other words, if you're an Egyptian, if you were following Pharaoh, a Hebrew woman was walking along in a stroller with her, her newborn son, guess what you did? He told you to snatch that son and drown that son in the river. Who does that? Who does such a cruel thing as that? Who, who actually wants? Now, now, here's the thing. You understand? Pharaoh is a black dude. This is a black man telling them, a black nation, to drown Hebrew children. Pharaoh's instructions now extended beyond the midwives to tell all the living in Egypt under his authority. Remember, he never rescinded the first order. They just wouldn't do it. It was still law that they were supposed to kill, uh, the midwives were supposed to kill these boys while they were on the birth stool. These Hebrew women. He never rescinded that. It just never worked because they wouldn't do it. Now he tells everybody, once that child is born, take them children and drown them. No, what happens here is paramount to what happens in chapter 2 of Exodus. So, that's where we're going to stop today. Tomorrow we'll pick up and see what, the next Sunday we'll pick up and we'll see what happens beyond that. So if you want to read along, Start reading through the book of Exodus. If you want to join us on Zoom, we'll be discussing in more depth this chapter that we just went over. But listen to this. First Peter writes about this. In First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. I want to leave you with this before we close. <coughs> Peter said, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you as though something strange was happening to you. We realize that many of us are facing a fiery ordeal. The whole world is facing a fiery ordeal of a pandemic. With this new strand, this new Delta strand, which is why I do not understand 
why people won't get vaccinated. Now, just, just me. Don't get mad because I said it. Because God didn't tell us to lose our common sense. Because 95, what is 95, 98% of the people who are dying, 98 point something, five or something like that, who are dying, or people who've never been vaccinated. All this outbreak in all these different states, and even right here in Texas, or outbreak of people who have not been vaccinated. Before, when the outbreak first happened, you know what was going on? You heard about a lot of elderly people getting COVID and dying. You know who's dying now? A lot of young people. Oh, but you thought it was past. You ain't been paying attention. In the Bible, whenever there was a plague, watch this. Whenever there was a plague, it always fell on the people that God was disciplined for doing something wrong. In other words, the plagues often fail on unsaved people. All the plagues we're going to get to in the book of, of Egypt, in, in the book of Exodus, guess who they fell on? They fell on the Egyptians. God spared Goshen where the, uh, where the Hebrews lived from any of those plagues. Because they had to be faithful to God. But when a plague affects everybody, and people keep saying, I can't wait to get back to normal. Well, no, we're not going to get back to what the normal we used to be. Because God doesn't want it to be that way. Because every time that we have incidents that happen, we never go back how things were before. Case in point, 9-11. How we travel has changed forever because of 9-11. Made lines longer. Everything we do about getting to the security. Things you can't carry, you can't take with you. How much luggage you can bring. All that change. You used to be able to go all the way to the gate to send off your loved ones, didn't you not? If you don't have a plane ticket, guess what? You can't go through there. All that change. So it's true with this pandemic. It will not be the same. Just trying to help you out. But you don't have to fear it. All you can do is trust God. Again, God didn't tell us to lose our common sense. Because the more that you decide that I'm not doing that, then you are the host that that virus loves because it keeps it around a lot longer. When the numbers start going down before the Delta variant, guess what happened? The sickness and hospitalizations dropped drastic. You remember that? And now, if you're not paying attention, now they're on the upswing again. And some of them are getting to the levels where they were at the worst part of this pandemic last year. All because people say, I'm not doing it. I'm not wearing a mask if I'm not vaccinated and I'm not getting a vaccine. I'm just not doing it. And then they have to t throw out there, well, I got faith in God. There's a difference between faith and foolishness. There's a vast difference between faith and foolishness. I promise you, if you broke your arm, and it was fractured. Well, it was a compound fracture, and you was in severe pain. And you say that I don't like take medicine. I've never taken medicine. But you go to the hospital in order to deal with that pain. They give you Vicodin. They give you a narcotic strength medicine to help you deal. I promise you'll take it. So you just told a lie because you said you wouldn't. And because maybe because you've never been in that situation. But all of the stories that you're hearing where these people are getting dying and on their deathbed. And they're looking up at these nurses and all because the reason why they're sitting there in that bed about to die is because they just wouldn't get vaccinated. That don't make sense to me. Somebody got to help me with that. I'm not putting down anybody today. I'm just saying that you got to uh, be smart about this situation. Amen. If you're not going to do it for you, do it for the people you love. Amen. If you're not going to do it for you, do it to people around you that you love. Because everybody, know, everybody in here knows somebody who died from COVID. Everybody and nobody's exempt. You know somebody. As I shared this story, I was telling a friend of mine. I was calling some of my friends. I was, I was excited about my book coming out. And I called one of my friends that I served with in the military. And we talked about 20 minutes. And after talking about 20 minutes, I said to him, I said, tell your lovely wife that we, we say hello. He said, you haven't heard. I said, heard what? He said, she died in December from COVID. I could just hear the brokenness in this man's voice as he tells me about his wife that he loved. 
When you saw them together, they were a great couple, a wonderful Christian couple. She was a lawyer and a judge. She had no underlying conditions at all. She was not on any medications. It attacked her lungs and took her out in short order. I believe she had the Delta variant of that disease. If only she could have lasted it for about six weeks. Not gotten sick for about six weeks when they start rolling out the vaccines. But she didn't get that opportunity. But I'm sure Michelle would have took the opportunity if she had known in hindsight, if it had been available. So why is it that people know that's available, but they say, I ain't doing it? I don't get it. But I'm not the one to explain it to. I just don't get it. Because we as pastors, when we get together and we talk about this issue, we care about our congregations, these meetings I'm going to with the pastors uh, every week about, about all of this. It's just heartbreaking to go to a meeting and you find out that in their areas of Fort Worth that's predominantly African-American, only 10% of that zip code has been vaccinated. These pastors can't open their churches back up because their members are in that zip code. And they come from that zip code. And that's the way it's going to be for the foreseeable future because they just can't. Because their members, a lot of their members from that, that same area. And they refuse to get vaccinated. And those pastors don't want those outbreaks in their churches, so they're not opening the churches back up. Think about that. Let me finish this text and we're done. Peter says, in verse 15 of chapter 4 of 1 Peter, he says, If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal activity or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. For it is a time for judgment to begin with the household of God, which I believe that's what's going on right now. Anytime God is allowing this pandemic to affect saved people and unsaved people alike. Now, to tell you something, God's not happy with any of us, if not all of us. Amen. He says, and if it is hard for the righteous, so it will be for the saved. What will become the ungodly and the sinner? So then, final verse, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good, he says. In other words, don't be surprised these things are happening to us. This is not our home. We're only on a journey passing through. But God gave us this Christian walk that we would enjoy this life he has given us. The Bible says in John 10, 10, that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The thief is, the, is Satan. Jesus said, but I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. So my question to you, why aren't you enjoying the abundant life? And the reason why you're not enjoying the abundant life, because you cannot enjoy abundant life the way God intends it in that text. And it's not all about financial resources either. The abundant life God wants us to live, that we be disciples and be a reflection of his glory every day. And the reason why many Christians can't live that way, because of the fact they do not take God seriously enough to follow him every day and to apply his word every day. See, what happened last week, yesterday, that's gone. We can't change that. But today... You don't have to leave here the same way you came. You can turn to God and say, God, that message was for me. I no longer want to be in bondage like the Egyptians in Egypt. I want to be set free. I want to be set free in my heart. I want to be set free in my mind. I want to be set in my spirit. Because I know I have not been doing this right all the way as you have prescribed. So to the Lord, right now, I ask for your forgiveness. And I turn my life to you and I ask that you would strengthen me and empower me to live this life in a way that would honor and glorify you. Let us pray together. Eternal God, our Father, we bow before you once again. Lord, we thank you, O God. We thank you for this message today. We thank you for the teaching today, O God. Help us to learn. Help us not only to know better, but do better. Help us to not just come and sing songs and, 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 and praise and, and say amen. But we leave and there's no change in our life. We go back doing the same old thing, the same old way at the same old time when you want better for us and you're trying to tell us 
to surrender our wills for your will. If you're here today and that speaks to your heart, just pray this prayer. I mean, say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to deliver me, oh God. I ask you to help me uh, get back on the straight and narrow. Lord, I realize, especially with this pandemic and everything else going on and racial unrest and all the financial difficulty going on, Lord, I have not been walking the walk I should. But today, that's going to change because I ask you to forgive me. And I invite Jesus into my heart, my life, even though I prayed this before. And even if I prayed this before, I'm praying it again right now. Lord, save me and deliver me and restore me is my prayer. Help me to be the child of God you created me to be. Help me to longer, no longer allow the situation and circumstances in my life to hinder me from doing your will. Help me to stop worrying about the things around me, oh God. Oftentimes I have no control over anyway. And help me, oh God, to not be bitter, but to be better. And I pray all these things, oh God, that whatever I lack you would add it to my life, that I may glorify you in all that I say and do. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said amen. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. Something a pastor said while he was preaching. It doesn't matter what you are going through. You are still here. And it's because God has taken you through. Hallelujah. Not a day's 
journey. Good. And I'm still here. Amen. Agape. We thank you for tuning in online with us today. Thank you all for being here with us today. I hope God has strengthened you and spoke to your heart today that you're encouraged to know that you're a child of the King. And nothing that you and I face that we go through, we go through alone. God is with us, but he also gives us brothers and sisters in Christ that we don't have to walk this journey alone. Amen? And we thank him for that. And so, if you've been blessed by today's message, we encourage you to go to our website at Agape. Uh, communityfellowship.org and there is a place you can donate. We would encourage you to give generously. We thank our Agape family who are not with us that still send their tithes and offerings and we're asking God that he would continue to use you to be a blessing uh, to us. We're still trying to raise mon money for our missions fund that we use to help our seminary families. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, we were able to bless each of uh, our families, our Nigerian families with a check on last week all because of your giving uh, above and beyond your tithes and offerings because that came from the mission fund budget uh, not the regular general budget but one thing we are doing that we talk about is my book that we use uh, to raise funds we're trying to sell as many copies as possible and so those of you are tuning in online that you can tell someone about this book you can go to Amazon you can also go to our website and read about the book and also it tells you ways that you can actually purchase the book you can also uh, contact me through my email that's on our website that you can contact me and, hey, pastor, I would like a signed copy of your book uh, and we'll work out arrangements so I can sign it and get it to you and find a way that you can send in payment. So I want to thank each of you for being here today. I thank God for all that he does in our lives. I pray that you enjoy your life. Despite everything that's going on, you should feel that I am blessed of God. I have the joy. The Lord is my strength and I'm good because God is good to me. Amen? Amen. Uh, one last announcement before we, we go is that in two, in Saturday, in, in two Saturdays from now, uh, from, the following Saturday, uh, from the following Saturday, is that we're going to be here at 8 o'clock and we're going to have a church-wide cleanup. We invite you to bring whatever cleaning, utensils, rags, and things that you would need. We're going to come and we're going to cut the grass. We're going to take it inside, outside. But we're going to need you to come because the more of us that come, then we get uh, finished a whole lot faster. And so our folks that clean the building, they've been doing a lot of that for the last year and a half on their own since this pandemic. Uh, and so we just want to come and give the church a good cleaning, uh, give them a break. And so we encourage you to come. That's uh, August 7th. Is, is that the uh, Saturday? August 7th. We're going to come early. If you want to come at 730, I plan to come early, try to beat a lot of the heat. Uh, especially, uh, I'll probably be helping out outside. And so we invite you to come. We're a family. A family works together so we can keep God's house really nice here at Agape. Amen? We thank God for each of you. We love you. And we pray that you would encourage those who don't get to watch the message when it's live streamed. You can go to the website and watch any message that's been preached from this pulpit going back, I don't know, about three, at least three years or more uh, that's on there. And so those of you missed the message today, you can tell somebody about it. One thing I do, because I do forget everything I say to you in a sermon, and so as I go out walking in my neighborhood or going to the gym, I put on, I, I turn on my phone and I plug my, put, uh, I link my, 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 my Bluetooth headphones and I listen to the sermon again that week. Because it's something that I need to hear from God uh, speaking to me as well. Amen. So I encourage you to do that and share that information somebody else that weren't able to hear it that they can go and hear it amen let us stand as we're dismissed god loves you unconditionally and we pray that god will continue to bless you and be good to you amen as he always has i don't know what you're struggling with i just pray you trust him amen receive your benediction may god bless you and keep you may he always make his face to shine upon you and may through your struggles of life that you give God your all. Take your focus off your circumstances and your situation and keep them on Jesus. Amen. May God bless you. May he watch between me and you as our prayer. And all of God's people said amen. 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 God bless you. Depart to serve. We'll see you on Zoom on Wednesday night at 7.